good morning, I'm sorry, good afternoon or good evening, Facebook friends and also New Beginning Church. We are here on Wednesday getting ready to start our Bible study. And we want you to know that we are just so glad that you have joined in with us. And we're going to ask that you sing along with us. The song is Awesome God. We know that God is in complete control of this world, and nothing gets past God. So we know that God is an awesome God. He reigns, oh, he reigns. He Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. Lord, we thank you for another privilege to come before you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for your word, Father God. We pray, Father God, that you bless as we come to dispense your word, to hear your word, to be blessed by your word. We ask you, Father God, to bless every hearer and bless my presentation that you will get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. We serve the awesome and the amazing God, <laughs> and he reigns, he reigns in heaven and in earth, he reigns, he is the almighty and the awesome God, amen? amen. We're looking tonight again at Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, we're on verses 12 through 18 tonight, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18 is where we will be looking again on tonight. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18 is where we will be looking again tonight. Amen. Amen. It's good to see everybody out again and looking at the Word of God. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verses, verses 12 through 18. Let's look at verse number 12. It says, Therefore, my beloved, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but also in my absence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let's look at that. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he's saying to this church at Philippi, whatever you do, continue in your obedience. Paul says to them, therefore, and whenever we have the word therefore, we have to go back and see 
This is in proper English, but whenever we have the word therefore, we have to go back previously to that word therefore and see what that word therefore is therefore. Amen? So let's look at this. Uh, he says therefore. So that means that something came before therefore, right? Let's look at verses number 9 through, through 11. He says, therefore God has highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, God has highly exalted Jesus. He has highly lifted up Jesus, has highly exalted Jesus above every other person. He has highly exalted Jesus above any other name. He has highly exalted Jesus and has given him a name above every name. Therefore, God also highly exalted him, him, Jesus, and given him a name above every name, that at the name, what name? Jesus. Every knee must bow, and every tongue must confess. God has highly exalted Jesus and given Jesus a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Where will these knees bow? They will bow in heaven. These knees will bow on earth. These knees will bow under the earth. We're trying to find out what the word therefore in verse number 12 is, right? Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and given Jesus a name above every name that at the name Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven. Every knee shall bow on earth. Every knee shall bow under the earth. <laughs> every knee shall bow. Then in verse number 11, he says, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, every knee shall bow in heaven, every knee shall bow on earth, every knee shall bow under the earth, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee gonna bow. Therefore, we may choose to buy now or we will buy later. When we look at the world in which we're living in today with the coronavirus running rapid, more politicians, more public servants, more doctors, more nurses, more medical technicians are talking about prayer than ever before. Prayer is being talked about more today than ever, ever before. Pray. Because the doctors realize, the politicians realize, that if you don't pray, we are not going to get through this. If those who are called by his name don't pray. If Christians do not pray, we can't get past this ailment that everybody is going through. And it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're poor or broke. It doesn't matter if you are educated or uneducated. Every knee must bow. Everybody is being called right now to pray. God has allowed us today to be called to pray. Whether or not God started it or not, whether or not God uh, will finish it or not, the fact is God is in control. In every knee must bow that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're going to get through it. We know we're going to get through it. We have faith that God is going to bring us through it. But we need to understand that every knee must bow in heaven. Every knee must bow on earth. And every knee must bow beneath the earth. And when they bow, they're going to confess Jesus the Christ is Lord. They must confess 
that Jesus the Christ, Jesus himself, the only son of God, is the Lord. He is Lord, and he is the Lord alone all by himself. Jesus Christ is Lord. There's nothing or no one who can appeal to our needs like Jesus Christ. There is nothing or no one who can come and make a difference today other than Jesus Christ. Even if the medical technicians and the doctors find a cure, it will be through Jesus. Every knee must bow. Every knee. There are people with two knees. They're going to have to bow. There are people with one knee. They're going to have to bow. There are people with no real knees, but they're going to have to bow to Jesus Christ and admit the fact that Jesus the Christ, he alone is God. And it's going to be to God's glory, the glory. You see, the fact of the matter is, we have been desensitized to the Holy Spirit. And as we have been desensitized to the Holy Spirit, then what we do is think that we are in control. They say the president gets it now. They say the president gets it. He, he gets it now. But if he really, really gets it, he's going to have to turn to Jesus Christ. If he really, really going to get it, if he really, really is going to, going to make sure that he gets it, if the USA is really going to get it, we all going to have to turn to Jesus Christ. Just the other day, just the other day, a, 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 a young man was doing a news report interviewing Bishop T.D. Jakes. He said, I've never done this on the air before, but Bishop Jakes, would you just pray? Would you just pray for this nation and this world? There's a lot more of that going to happen. <laughs> There's a lot more of that going to happen. The fact that, that Jesus the Christ is Lord. There's a lot more people that's going to ask for prayer. Yeah, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, Jesus Christ, he is, he is Lord. He is Lord. Every knee must bow, every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Then Paul says, therefore. He says, therefore. He says, verse number 12, he says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, Paul goes back to chapter 1. And reminds them of the same thing he reminds them in chapter 1. He reminds them again in chapter 2. He says, my beloved, you have always been obedient. He says, my beloved, you have been so obedient because you've given to me in time of need. You've given to the ministry. You've given to, to the ongoing of the ministry. And you have done that. You have done that in time of need. You have been obedient to the Holy Spirit. You have been obedient to God. You have looked out for the man of God. You've supported the preacher. You've supported me in ministry. You've supported me financially. You've been obedient to the words that I've given you from God. And because you have been obedient to the God, now I'm saying in verse number two of chapter, chapter two of Verse number 12 of chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. I'm saying to you, just as you've always been obedient, keep being obedient. <laughs> as you have been obedient, you've been obedient while I was in your presence. Not only have you been obedient in my presence, I need you now to be even more so obedient in my absence. He says, I need you to be obedient. In my presence, and I need you to be obedient in my absence. I need you to be obedient. I need you to be obedient. You see, sometimes when the leadership is not present, people are not obedient. Paul is saying to the church at Philippi, you've been obedient while I was there, and you've been obedient while I wasn't there. I'm asking you to continue to be obedient. Then he admonished them. 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It says work out your own salvation with, with, with fear and trembling. Now, he's not telling them to work in order to have salvation. And he's not telling them to work out your own soul salvation. Look at the text. The text declares that you ought to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. He says that we ought to work out our salvation, work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, in reverence to God. Work out your own salvation in, in reverence to God. He's saying this word work out is the same word we find when we exercise. It means to get after it. It, it means if you're going to get results, you're going to have to work hard to get results. It means to both serve and sacrifice. And we'll cover that a few, a few steps down the road. He says, not only, not only, not only should you be saved and enjoy your salvation, but you need to be saved to the point where you can work your salvation out. In other words, don't work for salvation. In other words, don't work in order to have salvation. He says work because you got salvation. We sacrifice because we're saved. We sacrifice because Jesus sacrificed for us. We sacrifice because God sacrificed his only son for us. So we work out our salvation. We work out we work out our salvation. We work it out. We work out our salvation. We, we work out our salvation. And we do it in reverence to God. We, we work out our salvation with reverence to God. We work out our salvation with reverence unto the Lord. When we look at this text, we, we find... Paul said to the church at Philippi, work out your own salvation and be respectful to the Lord and be respectful to other people. You know, there are some people who, who stand for the Lord and they don't have any jitters. They don't have any nervousness. But I tell you, because I'm working out with unto the glory of God, Every time I stand, I'm at awe with what God can do. Every time I stand, I'm, at ma I'm amazed with what God has already done with me and through me. Therefore, I can't approach it like I got it going on. I have to work out what I'm doing. I have to work it out with fear and trembling. I have to work it out with respect unto the holy God himself. Another thing we need to understand, we can't be in ourselves when we're working for the Lord. We have to be in the spirit of God, working, letting God, allowing God to work through us. Just because you can sing well doesn't mean that you got it going on. Because you can sing and God not get the glory. Just because you can teach and preach doesn't mean that you know what's going on around you and you got the word down so well because the fact of the matter is you're only being a blessing to the people when you give the glory to God. Whenever you operate in your element, don't brag about how well you operate in your element because three things ought to happen when you operate in your element. Number one, you ought to enjoy doing it. Number two, other people ought to get blessed from you doing it. And number three, God has to get the glory when you're doing it. If God doesn't get the glory, you're just going through the motions, baby. If you got the wrong motives, you're just going through the motions. If you're not being led by the Holy Spirit, you're, being, you're just going through the motions. So stop going through the motions and, and, and approach ministry with the respect of God and respecting others. Verse 13, he says, for it is God, it is God who works in you both the will and to do his good pleasure. 
It is God that works in us. It's, it's not us that make things happen on our own. It's, it's God that works in us. First of all, he says, he works in us the will. God is the one who even motivates us to work for God. I told you, I told you before that we have faith and we can't even brag on the faith because the faith that we have came from God. We can't brag on the faith we have. The Bible says that God has dealt unto every man, every woman, every child, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. God has dealt to every man a measure of faith, and because he has dealt to everyone a measure of faith, we can't even brag on our faith because our faith belongs to God. God is the one who has given us the faith we have. Our faith belongs belong to God himself. Our faith belongs to God. So he says, God is the one who who gives and works in us both the will, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We ought to have our focus, our mind made up that we're going to do what we do in order for God to have pleasure in it. We, we can't just do what we do. We can't preach and teach or sing, or usher, or or be be the person that, that wave at people when they walk in the door, people who, who get out of hand, we cannot be satisfied with that unless God receives the glory. Unto his, to God's good pleasure. It, it has to be God's good pleasure. It has to be God's good pleasure. It has to please God. And it's impossible to please God without faith. The problem is people trying to live this walk, life and walk this walk without faith in God. God will not be, be pleased if you don't walk with him in faith. Amen. I oftentimes says to the church, if, we, if we're not going to walk in faith, we might as well close the door, shut it down, and put the club on the outside. Churches have to walk in faith. As we end this, this threat, we're in, in this scenery with an unseen enemy today. As we are in this shutdown, we are in this, this lockdown, we are in this stay-at-home order, we need to understand that God is yet in control. We have to have faith that God is in control. He may not do what we want him to do, but God is making the things work out for his good, and so he can get the glory. And what he does, as a caveat, is allow us to benefit from it in the process. Let me tell you, churches all over the world today are, are doing something new. Church as we see it today, church as we are presenting it tonight, is something new. Many churches have never thought about live broadcasts. Many churches have never thought about recording their services. This is new for a lot of people. But God has already prepared every church for this moment. God has already prepared every Christian for this moment. When we will be shut up in our houses. Let me tell you, in, 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 in nine months, a lot of babies will be born. Husbands and wives are, are forced in the house together. <laughs> Police officers are having more cases of, of, of domestic abuse and violence because those who don't want to be together are forced in the same house together. The church and those of us who are Christians have to make sure we carry ourselves in such a way that there's a great benefit when this is over. We have to walk in faith. We have to walk and work out our salvation. In other words, put our salvation on display. Our salvation is on display because of our sanctification. Our sanctification is when we are set aside and other people see that we are set aside for the use of God himself. Let's look further. 
God gives this, this thing to us, this faith walk to us for his good pleasure. Verse number 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing. I lost somebody just there. I just, I just lost somebody. Do everything that you do without complaining and without disputing. In other words, don't complain about what you're going through. Don't fight about what's, what you're going through. Whatever you do, whatever you do, don't complain. Don't fight about it. Don't dispute about it. Don't argue about it. Whatever you do, do not complain about what you're going through. Heard a person complaining the other day, and all they had to do is sit down with somebody else and realize that they didn't have it going on badly at all. Because the moment you think you got things bad, all you have to do is look at someone else, and that person got it worse off than you would ever dream of. You complain about the church. You complain about your car. You complain about your house. You complain about your spouse. You complain about your friends. Usually people who complain, they complain about everything. And usually, usually when, when a person is complaining in a group, you can go and pick that one out of the group and say that's the one that's complaining. And the reason why you know that is because that's the same person that complained last week. It's the same person that complained when we got together before. See, complainers do one thing well, they complain. Paul says to the church of Philippi, and I say to the church that's listening to me, whatever you do, don't complain and don't dispute. Don't fight about it. Paul says earlier he want us to be on one accord. He want us to, to say the same thing, mind the same thing. He want us to be on one accord. We ought not complain and we ought not dispute. Don't you know your complaints and your disputes stop your blessings from flowing? It, it, it hinder your blessings. Complaining is right up there and disputing is right up there with gossip. And you know that that causes a short circuit. <laughs> you can't make connection with God and God can't connect with you because you're complaining, you're gossiping, you're disputing, you're fighting, you, you're arguing. And that's why the Bible says that don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, if you got a problem with somebody, clear it up before night falls. Clear it up before the sun rises. Stop complaining. Verse 14 says, do all things without complaining and dispute. Verse 15 said, that you might become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among those who shine as light. And you're shining as a light in this world. Let's back up and look at that. He says uh, that you may become blameless and harmless. Don't let the world look at you and point to you every time something goes wrong. Don't let the world look at you and, and complain about you because you're complaining about the world. Or you're complaining about your church. It's a sad day when a, a church member complains about his or her church or his or her pastor. It's, it's just like a, a woman who complains about her husband or a man who complains about his wife. We're all in this together. One thing about the coronavirus, it has put all of us on the same level. There are no big eyes. There are no, no, no small U's. All of us are on the same level. He says, don't complain. Do not dispute so that you can become blameless and harmless. James says the tongue is not easy to tame. We're able to, to tame wild animals, but we can't tame our, our own tongue. Little bitty thing. We can't tame it. But the idea is for you not to be perfect, but to be blameless and to be harmless. We, we, we ought to be Christians that we can walk with the Lord in times of trouble and, and trust him. We ought to trust the Lord in times of trouble where people won't point at us and say, that person is not blameless. 
When it talks about being blameless and harmless, it is putting us on the level as the world. Are you separated from the world or are you just like the world? What separates you? You're saved. He says, work out your salvation. He didn't say work out your soul salvation. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you're busy working out your salvation, you're busy working for the Lord and glorifying God, you are separated from the world because the world is not doing that. Be separated, be different, be blameless, be harmless, because you are the children of God. You are the children of God, and you are without fault. And then he tells us where we are. He reminds, Paul reminds us, as he reminds the church at Philippi, where you are. Look at what he says. He said, you are children of God, and if you are children of God, you ought to carry yourself like you are a citizen in heaven. Like you are a citizen of heaven. Like you are a child of God. You have to carry yourself differently. He says, even though we are in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. This is a crooked world. We live in a crooked world. We live in a dark and dismal world. We live in a world that's bad off. Just the other day, after things were happening and going wrong, someone asked the preacher, Preacher, what is this world coming to? He said, an end. What is this world coming to? An end. And let me tell you, the world is rapidly coming to an end. Paul even spoke about the day is coming when, when men won't, won't have God on their heart. They will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They will love the creation more than the creator. We're at that day. Yes, we are at that day. We are at that day when, when men are living in a crooked and perverse generation. We're living in this world. We have a whole generation, a whole nation, and several generations of people that are crooked. You're walking, you're walking in the, in the mall, and, and somebody dropped their wallet right in front of you. How would you handle it? I remember I used to go to the, to the mall, and when I went to the mall, I had, a, I had a spent Visa card. A spent Visa card, meaning that the Visa card got zero balance on it. I had about two or three of those in my pocket one time, and I was walking through the mall, and every time I walked past a new person, I, I, would, I would drop it. And let me just tell you, when I dropped my spent Visa card, if a person picked it up, they wouldn't have anything on it. But I just wanted to see how many honest people were there walking in the mall. Then I want to see how many honest people are there in the church. Drop my card. If I went there with three, I always left with none. Because that says to me, the people who saw me drop the card, pick the card up, and then call it to my attention. We live in a crooked and perverse world. We live in a, a generation of people that, that know not God and not interested in knowing God. Paul is saying to us, don't you be like that. When you go to the rodeo, and the entry fee, or, or go to the, the amusement park, and the interest fee for a five-year-old is different from a, a six- or seven-year-old. You get to the door, the man says, how old is he? You say, oh, he's, and you've already read the sign that it's cheaper for the five-year-old. Oh, he's five. And that baby, and the first thing that the baby wants you to know now is that I'm old. I'm older than that. So they'll say, no, I'm not five. I'm six. Shut up, boy. You five today. We live in a world that's not honest, a world that's crooked, a world that's always trying to get something for nothing. We are among them. But look what Paul says. Look what Paul says. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. Paul says in verse number 15, we live in a crooked and perverse world. He says, among whom you are 
You shine as lights in the world. You are the light of the world. We live in a dark and dismal world, but we ought to shine as the light. I've had, I've had a couple family members already that is said to have, have passed away because of the coronavirus. But we have to carry ourselves in such a way that people still look to us as the light of the world. We know that Jesus is the light. We know that Jesus is the light of the world. But Paul says that we are in darkness. We are in a perverse generation. And as we are in a perverse generation, we need to understand one thing. We are light. We are to generate and shine as lights. We ought to have little lights everywhere. We ought to have lights about us. The way we handle death ought to be different. The way we handle layoffs ought to be different. God has called the world attention to him now. God has the whole world attention now. He, we, we got people that sing the song and never sung the song before in public. He has the whole world in his hand. Everybody just think it's cute to talk about God having the whole world in hand, but God really has the whole world in his hand. He has the whole world right in his hand today. He has, and guess what? He didn't just get it in his hand. He didn't just start holding the world in his hand. God has always had the world in his hand, and the, the world has always existed and held together because of God. But it's good for us to understand and recognize today that God has the whole world in his hand. And we ought to be light shining in this world. We ought to be shining as light. The Bible teaches that men love darkness because their deeds were evil. We ought to be the ones to shine the light. We ought to shine the light. Verse 16, holding fast to the word of life. Holding fast to the word of life. Holding fast. Let me tell you, this word here gives us life. The word of God gives us life. It gives us life. You see, without God, you're just existing. Without God's word, you're just going through the motion. Without God, you don't really have all the abundant life that he has for you. God. In his word is what we need. We need the word of God. During this season of the lockdown, during the season of the shutdown, during this season where, where we are we're fastened off in our houses, and we ought to obey the laws of the land. We ought to fasten away. We need to do ourselves a favor as well as this world a favor and make sure the curve is flattened. It's our responsibility to flatten the curve. We ought to be reading the word, holding to the word of God, the word of life. We ought to be holding to it. We, some, of, some of us have never had time like we have time today. My question is, are you using that time for the word of life? This word that God has given us gives us life. Gives us life everlasting. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul saying to this church, as I have pastored you, as I have led you, as I have run for you and I've run with you, hold close to the word of life so that we may rejoice together. <laughs> In the day of Christ. He says, he says, I want to be able to rejoice over what I put my hands on. There's nothing more powerful than a parent rejoicing over his or her child after they have put something into that child and that child has lived it out. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, right here in verse number 16, he says that hold on to the word of life. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on to the word of life that I may rejoice. I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have run not in vain, 
and that I have not labored in vain. Preachers all over the world wondering every now and then they wonder, am I laboring in, is my labor in, in vain? Is my labor in vain? I'm, I'm even wondering sometimes, is my labor really in vain? Is my labor in vain? Am I, am, am, am what, is, it, is what I'm doing making a real difference? Paul says, stay with the word of life. So I rejoice one day, knowing that my labor, knowing that my running for the Lord was not in vain. You see, no church is more powerful and stronger than its weakest link. It is imperative for all of us to strengthen each other. Is my teaching in vain? Is my preaching in vain? Is my service in vain? Is my sacrifice in vain? Paul says, hold on to the word of life so when Jesus see me, when I get to see Jesus, my labor will not be in vain. The day of Christ is coming. He's going to reward us for what we've done in this life. And I want to make sure I get it right so my labor won't be in vain. I want to make sure you get it right so my labor will not be in vain. Verse number 17. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. You got to get a good picture of this drink offering. Many times the the children of Israel, many times those in the Philippian church, when they made sacrifices to the Lord, they would pour an offering, a, a liquid, they would pour it out on the altar as their sacrifice, as their offering unto the Lord. It was their sacrifice unto the Lord. They would pour it out like a drink offering. Look what Paul says. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I want to be, yes, if I'm pouring, I want to make sure that I can rejoice and you can rejoice. He's saying, I understand, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. Now look, let me tell you what Paul is saying. Now remember in previous verses, Paul says, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Paul says that regardless of of my being locked up in this Roman jail, I'm writing you a letter, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. So it says to us that he wants to be a living sacrifice, this drink offering. He wants to be a living sacrifice of service and, and a living sacrifice unto mankind. Some theologians have said that Paul was looking ready to die, but when you, and not in this particular verse, because later on in Timothy, he says to Timothy, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering now. He says, my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. In other words, I've been to the mountaintop. I'm ready to die now. But he's not talking, he's not saying this in Philippians, for he's saying that I'm looking forward to living. I'm looking forward, and I believe with your faith and with God's grace, I'm going to live. But while I'm living, I want to be spent. What Paul is saying is that I want to be drained of everything within me for the Lord. My question to you today, are you drained for the Lord or are you drained for yourself? There are a lot of people tired right now. A lot of people sleeping over right now. But my question is, the reason why you're tired, is it because of your own accord or is it because you have given it all up for the Lord? I never liked that song. I never have liked that song that says, I've been running for Jesus and I'm not tired yet. The reason why I don't use that song, I'm, I've been running for Jesus and I'm not tired yet is because in my body, in my emotions, even in my spirit, I've been running for Jesus and I'm tired. So it says to me, the songwriter says to me that he has not been running hard enough for the Lord. 
she has not been running long enough for the Lord. Because when you run hard, when you run long, when you do sacrifices unto the Lord, when you abuse your innermost being unto the Lord, when you give your all to God, you're going to get tired in your mind, mentally, in your, in your body, physically, and your spirit man will even be drained. Paul is saying here that I'm willing to be poured out like a drink offering. I'm willing to be sacrificed. I am sacrificing all that I have for the Lord. It's like a basketball player who's playing basketball and the coach looks at him on the field, on the court, and he says, leave it all out there. Leave it all out there. Don't bring it to the bench. Leave it all out there. What the coach is saying is whatever you do, give it all you have. Paul is saying here in verse number 17, I I'm willing to give it all I have. I'm willing to give it all I have in service, I'm willing to give it all I have as a sacrifice. Some people going to church, they're just going through the motion. They just, they just glad to have church. They're not going to sacrifice anything. If it doesn't fit them well, if they're not comfortable in it, they're not going to do it. I oftentimes tell the people at the New Beginning Church, it, it, it has become my responsibility to pull you out of your comfort zone. All of us have to be out of our comfort zone. All of us have to sacrifice something. All of us have to give beyond measure. All of us have to give of ourselves. Paul says, I don't have a problem with service. I don't have a problem with sacrifice. What I'm saying to you today is, you give it all for the Lord now. And on the other side, you'll be happy and the Lord will be happy. You give it all for the Lord right now because if you give it all for him now, you don't have to worry about what your, reward, your rewards look like on the other side. Leave it all on the court. <laughs> Leave it all on the field right now. Paul is also saying that I, I'm not selfish in this matter. Paul is saying that I'm not selfish in this matter because the fact of the matter is I'm going to give it all to the Lord and I'm going to give it all for the Lord. I'm going to sacrifice for him and I'm going to serve him. I'm being poured out like a drink offering. Finally, verse number 18. He says in, in verse 17, before I leave there, he says, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. In other words, we all ought to be rejoicing together. We, we rejoice together. When someone is blessed in our household, someone is blessed in our church family, someone is blessed in our neighborhood, we ought to all rejoice together. We ought to be glad. We, I am glad and rejoice with you all. I'm so glad that life for you is good. I may be struggling right now, but I'm glad that God is bringing you through. I'm glad you have a testimony because I know one day I'm going to have a testimony too. I'm glad about it. And I rejoice with you all. Verse number 18. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul says, don't leave it up to me to rejoice with you and be excited about what's going on in your life. But you ought to also rejoice with me. We're in it together. We, we're in it together. And for the first time in the history of the United States of America, many politicians are saying we're in it together. Prior to coronavirus, <laughs> the, 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 the Congress couldn't come together. The Republicans had their plea. In the, the Democrats had their plea. But within one week, they passed the biggest financial bill they have ever could pass. Because God has a way of bringing us all together. Let me just say to you today, don't want to God bring you together. <laughs> Let's come together. Let's come together. If we are the Christians of this world, we ought to be the one that's praying unto the Lord. We ought to be the one that's making a difference. We ought to be the one that God is pleased with. We ought to be the one that's bombarding heaven. I told you last week that we need to pray unto the Lord and supplicate unto the Lord because God is listening and waiting on the Christian to have something to say. 
unto him. We ought to be set apart. We ought to be different. We ought to be changed. And the, the world ought to see our changes. The only fear and trembling we ought to have is the fear and the trembling unto the Lord. Paul says, I rejoice and I'm happy about it. I rejoice and I'm happy about the fact that you're going to work out your soul, work out your salvation, not your soul salvation. Our soul has been fixed. We've been saved. We've been born again. We're on our way to heaven. But you ought to work out your salvation. Work it out with fear and trembling. In other words, if I don't give God all I have, then is he going to be pleased with me? We ought to make sure that we give it all to God, that he will be pleased with us. Spiritually, physically, sacrificially, give it all to God. And as we give it all to God, we can all rejoice together with no complaints, no disputes. We just give it all to God. And as we give it all to God, God is able to bless us real good. A heap and a plenty. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. Now, Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for who you are and for what you do. Lord, we realize that we are in the midst of a battle. We are in the midst of a fight. We are in the midst of injustice. We are in the midst, Father God, of panic and pandemonium. Lord, we come to you. We pray that you bless us. Give us the answer. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk as children of light. Bless us that we will present ourselves unto the Lord, that we will sacrifice and we will serve you. And Lord, that you will receive the glory and that it will be to your good pleasure. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. When we thank God for who he is and what he's already done, we serve the awesome and the amazing God and we thank God for who he is and what he has already done. And let me just share with you, it is offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord. It is time to give unto the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we want to make sure that you understand the way you can give unto the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to, see, we want to make sure that you understand you can give by way of cash app, that our ministry can keep rolling. Our cash Tag is dollar sign NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls is our cash app. Please, ma'am, please, sir, especially those of you from the New Beginning Church, if you have not given your tithes and offering, there are two ways to do that. First of all, cash app. Cash app is dollar sign NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. In our P.O. box, you can mail it in. Our P.O. box is 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a blessing. And thank you for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning at 1045 a.m. for a glorious time in the Lord. Thank you so much. God bless you. And God's keep you is our prayer.